Hello, and welcome to the Board on Earth Sciences and Resources webinar entitled, A Landscape Restoration Puzzle, When Natural Isn't What You Thought It Was. My name is Nicholas Rogers. I'm a financial and research associate with the board. Our speaker for today is Dr. Dorothy Merritt, a professor in the Department of Earth and Environment at Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Dr. Merritt is a geologist with expertise in streams, rivers, and other landforms, and on the impact of geologic processes, climate change, and human activities on the form and history of Earth's surface. Dr. Merritt received her bachelor's in geology from Indiana University of Pennsylvania, her master's in engineering geology from Stanford University, and her PhD in geology from the University of Arizona. Dr. Merritt and her research collaborators have done some really exciting work in unraveling the natural and human processes that have shaped riverine landscapes in the eastern United States. And they propose a surprising pre-industrial scenario that explains high sediment loads in the Chesapeake Bay and other water bodies. Their work also has significant implications on how we restore our streams. <clears throat> the webinar today will look more deeply at Dr. Merritt's research and the fascinating story it weaves among geomorphology, ecosystems, and human history. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. The audio for today's event will be streamed through your computer speakers. We will be taking questions through the Q&A box located in the lower right-hand side of your screen. Simply type your question in the box at any time and click send. Please note that your question is limited to 256 characters. We ask that you leave the box set to send your questions to all panelists. This webinar is also being recorded. Please understand that any questions you submit may be read aloud and included in our recording. A link to the recording, as well as a copy of the slides, will be posted to our website within the next week or so. If you have any technical issues during the event, please contact, contact WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3239. Once again, the number for WebEx Technical Support is 1-866-229-3239. With that, I'd like to get started and turn things over to our distinguished speaker, Dr. Dorothy Maritz. Dorothy. Thank you, Nicholas. I'm still transferring over here. Um, give me one moment, please. So Nick, is my desktop been shared there yet with you? Yep. Good, thank you so much, Nick. It's my pleasure to be talking to some unknown number of people, I don't know their number right, right off the hand uh, myself at the moment, but I'm really delighted to have a chance to communicate to all of you from my office. And some of my crew is here with me, my research collaborators, Bob Walters here and others. And we're excited about sharing the results of all of this work that we've been doing for over a decade. And it touches upon many different aspects of the earth sciences, including um, wetlands and their origins and wet, um, formation and restoration of streams and wetlands, dams and dam removal, anthropogenic impacts on natural systems, water quality, permafrost, permafrost thaw, climate change, and of course the recent um, history of human activity and its impact on landscapes. So we'll touch on a number of those. And many of the things that I'll talk about today are um, discussed in publications and on websites, and I'll cite those as I go, so you can always go look at those publications or websites. And at the end, I'll have a list of the, the many collaborators that I've been fortunate to work with, and many students, and the, and the many funders to whom we're grateful, and landowners. Case in point here, this is Great Marsh, Pennsylvania, and Jim Moore and the Moore family have graciously allowed us to work here. And some 60 years ago, they allowed Paul Martin, the same paleontologist, to work there as well. So we're building upon his early work from over half a century ago. And when you look at this landscape from the air as, as here, it appears to be very natural. In fact, it has uh, amazingly high water quality. It's a wetland, a wet meadow with sedges, tussock sedges. It's an Audubon important bird area. It's saturated at the surface um, year round. For that reason, it has tussock sedges. And it's been a marsh, a, a wet meadow, um, for about 11,500 years. Um, however, there are things about it that aren't immediately apparent. And one of those is that the pond that you saw in the previous view is actually not natural. It was made with dynamite by the Moore family in the 50s. And Jim Moore tells us that as a boy, he watched the organic mud raining down on those cars you see in the view. So it's a very um, clear example of the impacts of anthropocene using dynamite to make a pond in a wetland. And there were efforts even before that 
to try to drain this wetland, that ditch that flows through the view is actually not a natural stream channel, it's a, a human-made ditch from the mid-19th century. And what's intriguing to us is that this is one of the very few examples we know of not buried by historic sediment. And that's how we got involved in this work initially. We were looking at the historic sediment that is so ubiquitous in the valley bottoms, and it buries nearly every valley bottom in the mid-Atlantic Piedmont region. And yet it's not here. So what we have here is a rare glimpse into what might have been prior to the burial of so many of the valley bottom landscapes historically, and I'll come back to that later. What's also interesting here is that there's something that's a little more natural than we might have thought it was. And that is the actual structure of the landscape is very old. It dates back to the Pleistocene. It dates to cold climate conditions. And the bulk of what we're seeing is the result of cold freeze thaw phenomena. And on top of that, we have a thin veneer of organic sediment, that's the wetland down the valley bottom, produced by the accumulation of organic matter from plant matter over time. And that's a very thin capping on it, the little film from the Holocene, the last roughly 11,000 years. So there's a much older legacy here, and you can see it if you use LIDAR and get a bare earth view, as we're doing here with PA's LIDAR. So we've made a slope shade. You can actually see, if my arrow is working for all of you, on the slopes there are these low-baked features, and these are what we sometimes call drool. It's, it's fractured, crushed up rock material generated by rock fracturing during freeze-thaw times, moving down the slopes, moving down in big alluvial sands out into the valley bottom, probably blocking the valley bottom down here. And then there are places where there were thermal car slumps, like we see throughout the Arctic today, often called retrogressive um, thaw slumps. And these various phenomena from permafrost thaw then led to stuff from the hillsides going to the valley bottoms and making a very good permeable substrate, a rubbly substrate, on which wetlands could form during thaw. And Paul Martin did his coring and trenching out here, which I'll talk about later. There's Paul Martin. The Moore family has pictures of him when he was out there. He was a young postdoc at the time. And he was digging and coring, and he published a marvelous paper that I highly recommend you read, in which he talked about these shallow cores in this marsh, wondered why this marsh was so rare today. And it got some of the first data on pollen and climate change from that pollen record for this region. He was the first to show that adjacent to the last full glacial ice margin, we didn't have a temperate forest at that time, circa 20,000 years ago, but rather we had tega tundra. And he says in the paper we probably had bare solar flexion slopes. And so a marvelous insight of his, he recognized based on the vegetation what the landscape must have looked like. Um, he also did early, an early example of radiocarbon dating. So he was able to show that this marsh um, became established somewhere at the end of the last Pleistocene going into the early Holocene. Here's an example of permafrost um, thaw and gelofluxion lobe or solifluxion lobe formation today. And you can see that it moves material of all sizes, even boulder size, down slopes even at very low gradients. And that's the stuff we now see throughout the Mid-Atlantic Piedmont region and in the Ridgeon Valley, in the valley bottoms as well as on the side slopes. And that's what then Holocene wetlands were able to form upon once the ground had thawed. What we're seeing in LIDAR then with the bare earth views is these low bait structures, these forms, that when they're active, they're, they're moving during times of thaw when the active layer is thawing, they move very slowly, a few centimeters a year perhaps, down slope, um, but always during times of thaw. Here's an example of our LIDAR analysis from central Pennsylvania, again a slope shade. You can see the thaw, material from thaw moving down the slopes into the valley bottoms in places as many tens of meters thick. It's often better developed on one valley side than on one hill slope side than another given the, um, the aspect and the facing of the sun. But what's neat here is you can also see that going down the main valley in this valley within the Ridgeon Valley, it's a shale valley, that there are these large step-like features going down and these are also gelofluxion. So even the valley bottoms themselves acted as hill slopes during these cold times. It's the advancing and retreating of um, the ice sheets that we often are most familiar with and the glacial legacy of that um, kind of advancing and retreating. But at the same time, the last two million years or so, we've had advancing and retreating permafrost boundaries. And that's what we're looking at in this area here in the Mid-Atlantic region, primarily Pennsylvania and Maryland, is what's the record of that advancing and retreating of frozen ground? And it might have been over 100 meters thick in places, and we're trying to estimate that. So we need to keep in mind then that this is happening over and over for the last, here only, I'm only showing 600,000 years, but cold times, warm times, cold times, warm times. This is the proxy record then 
for the warm and cold times. And at the moment, we're in a warm period. So it's very um, tempting at times to think that the landscapes always look the same, but of course it hasn't. It's actually been much colder most of the last 600,000 years ago than it is today. And note also that there was a very abrupt warm warming circa 18,000 years ago. And within that warming period since end of last glacial maximum, there have been some brief episodes of rapid warming. So here what I'm showing is the position of the last glacial maximum ice sheet with its margin circa 21,000, 18,000 years ago. And then I'm showing the work from French and Millar that is um, a record of where there would have been perhaps continuous permafrost or some kind of permafrost. They can't quite tell from the record they compiled in 2013. It's largely a record of people finding colluvium and so forth, but also um, some other paraglacial features. But now what I'm showing is today where there is continuous permafrost, the darker blue, down to an isotherm of about minus 8 degrees Celsius, then discontinuous down to about minus 1 degree Celsius, and then sporadic or isolated. So we'd have to go that far north today to get to a place where there is permafrost. And it's all through the news at the moment um, what's happening as permafrost thaws with modern warming. So the mid-Atlantic region is a very good analog, or in some ways an analog, for how, what happened down here farther to the south when this landscape was per, per, had permafrost and then warmed and that permafrost began to retreat or to thaw and disappear. So that in the previous view, there's a line going from north to south. And in Anderson and Anderson, the book written by Anderson and Anderson, they show along that line from north to south, very thick permafrost at about 400 meters to much thinner, getting to the zone where it goes from continuous to discontinuous and then sporadic. And what we are finding is that this is probably a very good analog for Paleo-Pennsylvania, where there was continuous permafrost. And then going into Maryland, it becomes discontinuous. And we're basing that on the landforms that we're studying and mapping and investigating. And then going into Virginia, we have to go to higher altitudes to get um, find evidence of permafrost, although there is some at higher altitudes. So the landscape's a record of that paleo-temperature gradient. The best modern analog we have found for what this region might have been like is actually Antarctica. There are some differences, of course, but what's common is that both places were very dry. Um, modern day Antarctica is very dry in the dry valleys, and Paleo-Pennsylvania, Paleo-Maryland was very dry, and that's based on other people's work, not just our own. So it was very windy, very dry, frozen much of the time. And so we don't see um, fluvial processes acting in some of the main valleys because they're frozen. We do see lots of thermal contraction polygons. It's cold enough for the ground to crack. And that's diagnostic. It's a clear indicator of continuous permafrost. We see many gelifluction lobes and benches, nivation hollows, et cetera, thermal karst ponds. And those, we see all of those in Pennsylvania, Paleo-Pennsylvania. So now going back and looking at Great Marsh, what we should keep in mind is we're looking at a landscape that at the moment is thawed but has been frozen for much of the last two million years, probably, or at least the last 600,000. The work of T.C. Hales, Josh Brewing, others, um, Joel Marshall is showing that um, the time the landscape spends in the frost cracking window down here at minus three to minus eight degrees Celsius is very important because that affects the intensity of frost cracking. So the more time it spends in that window, that's the maximum conditions for getting frost cracking, and the deeper that that gets, the more um, shattered material will be produced. And Pennsylvania has a lot of shattered material, as you'll see, and Pennsylvania has some as well. So looking here at the work of Jill Marshall, what she has done is taken global um, climate models and downscaled them and then used them with frost, with temp used the temperature to look at frost cracking and to estimate frost cracking intensities. You can see the scale bar down here from her work. So showing frost cracking intensity in degrees Celsius per centimeter um, it, it's done over a year, an annual year basis. And so using various um, climate models, we can show that in the region we're working, that it's likely that, given the, the climate modeling, that we would have had conditions for conducive to um, intense, very intense frost cracking. And of course, the landscape verifies that and supports it because we have many shattered rocks on the slopes. You can trace these shattered rocks up to the ridge crest and the forest areas. Many previous workers have mapped this colluvium. What's new and different now is being able to use LIDAR to actually see the shapes of these um, deposits and then to track how they move downslope to look under the trees, for example. We have some very exciting and new independent evidence that supports that the ground was indeed, that it was indeed that cold here, and that is the existence of thermal contraction polygons. 
that I, I showed those in the Antarctic earlier in that pre previous photograph. And a researcher by the name of Gao in 2014 published a map in which he showed all these little red dots as places where he had found thermal contraction polygons in New Jersey, Annapolis, et cetera. And we realized that we would surely have them here because we had seen some of these in outcrops and quarries and other workers had. And we thought, surely we could do it if Gao did, and he was using Google Earth to do it. So here's his Google Earth work that was published in his paper in 2014. And he showed that he could find these polygons, he could map them and sketch them. And at certain times of year, he could not. So it all depends on soil moisture and the dryness of the soil. So we began looking as he had done. You have to get close down to the Earth's surface. And sure enough, we found them very quickly. We knew where to look initially because we had seen evidence of these and others had in outcrops and quarries. You can see the polygons along the hillsides here up and over these little mesa-like summits. This is the shale hills of central Pennsylvania. We got more and more excited, began using satellite imagery, and we could do an even better job. This is the same area looking straight down using satellite imagery. What this tells us then is that it certainly was very cold, minus 3 to minus 8 degrees Celsius, maybe even colder, but um, it certainly would have had continuous permafrost. And it explains then why um, Bob Walter and I and our colleagues have had a very hard time finding deposits that we would consider to be truly fluvial in origin. And it's because the landscape has been frozen so much of the time. Here's a good view then we just found this summer of one of those polygon boundaries in outcrop along the road cut. And what, what's exciting to us is that it's filled with sand. And the sand tells us then that it was, that it was aeolian dust blowing about. We've sampled this now and are getting ready to do some OSL work and other work with it. Um, it tells us then a little bit more about the conditions at the time. And it tells us also that it was not very wet. We would have had ice wedge, more typical ice wedge casts. Instead, we just have the cracking of the ground and then the opening of it. We're working with Mark Dimitrov and others on this, and it's a really neat new part of our work. We find these all the way down to the valley bottoms, except that in the valley bottoms, as here, we often find these darkened swales. Now, they're actually dark because they're moist, and we can only see these at certain times of the year. And they, they're, in a loose way, connected with these networks with the polygons themselves. And they're filled with white silt, which we interpret to be a reworked loose. And on that white silt, there's an organic rich layer that has formed. And so these were wetlands then throughout the Holocene, although today this area is farmed, and I'll show that in a moment. So here's another view of the same area. It's near Carlisle, Pennsylvania. You can see that the tributaries, and these are not really streams, they're just low swales that are moist, are all parallel or subparallel. They follow bedrock fractures, and then there's this other fracture pattern from the polygons itself. Here we are looking at a different time of the year, and you can see we can't see that, that phenomenon, which is so remarkable. We began wondering about these and wondering why we would have these silt filled moist swales that are branching and spatially extensive and interconnected with the polygons. And we then came across a paper by Joe Levy and his colleagues from Antarctica, again, the, the Dry Valleys region or Taylor Valley region. And we realized that this explained very well what we're seeing because they're not truly gullies. They're not cut down by flowing water. They're, they're seepage gullies. They're seepage from permafrost thaw and from the act of layer thawing and water seeping out, snow melting, et cetera, and it brings down some small, relatively small amounts of the finer material into the valley bottom where it accumulates. So these are widespread, we think, in this region and can be found now with Google Earth and other imagery. We find all sorts of retrogressive thaw slumps, as I had mentioned. We can find them on the LIDAR as well as the field. We find they're more erosional gullies. Um, we have seen evidence that these lakes, thermocarst lakes that have dried, they're around the State College area. And of course, in the Mid-Atlantic Piedmont, what we have begun to realize is that um, various types of stems or wet meadows had become ubiquitous then with thaw, such as Great Marsh. So we went back out with Candace Graham Free, Chris Bernhardt, and others, and Aaron Markey, our postback researcher, and we've done some coring, and we've um, done a lot of radiocarbon carbon dating. So you can see here we have a number of cores, and we're using them for different purposes. All of them have at the top this thick, dark, organic-rich layer. This particular layer appears human disturbance. And then they all have basically the same stratigraphy going down. And this one in the middle here is one we're looking at for seeds. There are some we're looking at for pollen. That's Chris Bernhardt's work at the USGS. And then, of course, the dating. You can see the dates here on the left. This light-colored, silty layer down here we interpret as loose of some sort in the valley bottom about, about 20,000 years old. All right, here's some of the seeds we extract. This is a one millimeter square grid. 
um, they all, in the case of grape marsh and the other black soils, organic rich soils that we look at, are consistent with um, wet meadows, wet um, marshes. Sometimes we find the submerged aquatic organisms indicating that there were pools of water. But always it indicates a low energy environment um, and much like what we're finding today in the Arctic as permafrost thaws. So in the simplest way, we could, we could take one of these cores and look at it from bottom on the, down here in the lower right to top. And we can see these very sharp stratigraphic boundaries. And we could, by interpreting the pollen, the seeds, the radiocarbon dates, et cetera, other things in there, what we've determined is that we essentially had some sort of firmer karst pond at the end of last full glacial, last glacial maximum, and then a transition, which is, we refer to as the great thaw or the big thaw, because we often see some evidence of erosion at that surface or lack of deposition or both. Then we typically see, what we're beginning to realize is, a period of warming that we have dated to the timing of the boiling alarod, and it has um, wetland formation that had begun, and then a period of cooling, which correlates to the younger dryest, and they have less organic matter um, and, and drier conditions, it seems, and then again, warming and wetter conditions in the early, early Holocene, and from these cores and our other sites, these Holocene wetlands remained stable and sustained throughout the Holocene. And in fact, they, can, they retain carbon over that time period. So they're major reservoirs of carbon. So we're going then from frozen to thawed to warm, cool, warm for the last 18, 19,000 years. Looking in more detail, ignoring the human disturbance zone here, you can see then that record of carbon accumulation. We're using a proxy for loss of ignition, but it's basically showing us a lot of carbon stored in the upper 40 centimeters. You can also see here in the middle from the oxygen ice from the 018 data from my um, Antarctic Greenland, excuse me, this period of warming here, which is the boiling alarod, and then the cooling here, which is the younger dryas. And um, you'll see in a moment that we can pick up evidence of that at some of our sites, including Great Marsh. The pollen data from Chris Bernhardt showing the change from pine to oak. And note the hemlock, we do actually find hemlock commonly at the very base of the Holocene wetlands, down around 10, 11,000 years. We actually find small cones from the hemlock. Here's a seed work that Aaron Markey and colleagues have done. And I won't go into the details of it except to point out that these are all consistent with a wet meadow with open pools, potomogetons, a lot of carex, tussock sedges, there are many different sedge species. So really a, a remarkably wonderful landscape for 10,000 years or so, a little bit longer, 11, 12,000 years. And here are the dates over here. But notice that we actually had wetland plants before carbon began to accumulate. And we're not quite sure yet how to interpret that, but that is the record. So we pick out um, our, our associates for picking out thousands of seeds from this and other sites. So it's a great record of what was happening locally. I'll talk briefly about this abrupt climatic transition right here, the bowling alarod, this um, relatively sudden warming from about 12.7 to 14.7 thousand years ago, which we see stratigraphically. And we see that during that period of warming, there actually was some wetland formation. And then you can see here in this plot of depth versus age, here's the disconformity. We have older sediment then right here, and juxtaposed right on top of it, um, this much younger sediment. So a disconformity, and then starting about the middle end of the bowling alarod accumulation that was steady of um, organic rich sediment up through the time of modern human disturbance. And there was compaction of the wetland. That great March wetland, which looks so beautiful, was dynamited and ditched, et cetera actually also was a cow pasture for a long time, so there's some compaction in it. I want to show you another site now, because Great Marsh is not our only site. We actually have well over 120 sites, and um, there, each one of them is a, a new record for us. There's a, there are a lot of similarities, but a, a few differences from here to there. Many of them have sewer lines running through them, as this one does along Piney Run in Maryland, and this is the, the, boulder, the boulders that are used to protect the sewer line. And many of them have had mill dams and mill ponds and have been buried as this one has. So this one has a record of burial of, um, of, of organic rich sediment and of Pleistocene rubble and of bowling alarod deposits and so forth. We've been using um, geophysics and it's determined that in places of up to 10 meters or so of valley fill, which is all colluvium from material coming off the side slopes, and it's quite bouldery in places. In fact, right over here, there are large piles of boulders, quartz boulders that a farmer had dragged over there at some time in the past. So there's clear evidence that material had moved, sediment had moved off these slopes, sediment produced by frost shattering into the valley bottom, and it's gradually filling the bottom, and then in places, 
wetlands form within that substrate. And we'll look at a few of those. Here's one right here. And then we've done some trenching out here, about I think eight or nine trenches by now at this site. You can see that we're looking, I'll go back and show you where we are here. We're looking right along, there's a slope nearby here. We're going that way in the lower left there. Um, so we're, we're looking at colluvium, which came off the hill slope in the background. And as we come down that slope, which is now buried by historic sediment, um, anthropogenic sediment, that, that slope had gradually merged with a wetland, which had begun forming at about 11,500 years ago at this location. And then it had accumulated organic matter and filled up with time and kept growing and growing and getting thicker and thicker, that, that wet soil with wet meadow seeds. And then something happened and it was buried by historic sediment. And what happened then was that um, settler, European settlers arrived and began clearing the land. There was mining in the area, charcoaling. They were building dams for various purposes. They were manipulating the streams, the valley bottoms, the wetlands. And um, so you can see that this once amazing wetland, which would have looked much like Great Marsh, now is buried by several four or five feet or so of historic clay and silt, which came off the hillside as well. There's largely a fine sediment record in contrast to the colluvial record from the Pleistocene, which is much coarser and poorly sorted. And you can also see with the brick that I've sampled here how amazingly um, cohesive and organic rich this material is. Recently, we were very fortunate after some flooding to see uh, the oldest wetland we have yet been able to sample so well, which is right down here by Bob Walter and Bill Hillgartner. They're down there sampling it. It was exposed during a low water of the, um, time right after some flooding. And I'll show a close-up in a moment. And what's exciting to us is that it's under sediment that is mass movement in origin, which came off the slope from the background. And you can see it has lobate shapes to it, in fact. Part of it's blocked behind the bank slump. A lot of the, a lot of the banks here are slumping. But um, back here underneath, and I'll show a close-up, is this organic rich material. It's just under the water. It's still at groundwater level. Um, this water level, in fact, is base flow, essentially. It is the long-term groundwater table level. So that wetland would have been forming from their dating. We have multiple dates here at roughly 13,500 to 13,400 years ago during the boiling Alarod warm phase. And we found oak leaves in it, um, a lot of sedge seeds, and also a black spruce needle, which is, according to Bill Hogutner, consistent with other findings in ecology, paleoecology, that show that during this transition from cold to warm during the boiling Alarod, that you can actually, we can actually have both cold and warm species coexisting. There's not, no modern analog quite like that today. We'd have to go much farther north to find black spruce. But this wetland, this early wetland, it was forming on top of the Pleistocene rubble, actually then had within it some cold and warm species. Farther downstream along Piney Run, there's a very thick and spectacular exposure, much like what we see in the trenches of a Holocene wetland soil, which again is very much like the Great Marsh soil, and um, which is not buried in the case of Great Marsh. And it's formed on this rubble of boulders and so forth from the Pleistocene last full glacial maximum and, and earlier probably multiple repeated events of this permafrost and permafrost thaw. And we see, every now and then we see this um, slightly finer lens of rubble which appears to be associated with maybe some winnowing and some pulses of material coming out of debris flow like slurries um, down the valley. But you can also see here some of this set, the seeds we're pulling out, um, multiple tussock sedge seeds and so forth, um, photomagetin. So we know that it was a wet meadow, again, in this case. So the ecology uh, with the seed is very helpful to as much as with Paul, for Paul Martin. The pollen was useful to give him a sense of the regional climate, but we're looking at local landscapes and local hydrology. Um, these wet meadows would have been wet um, much of the year. In fact, they would have had water at the surface throughout the year. Why does this matter then to modern streams and to stream restoration today? So I, I urge you to please look at the website that Kayla Schulte put together for us last year. B, um, BSR stands for Big Spring Run. It's one of our key sites for a restoration experiment that we're doing with NSF funding with many collaborators. And also to look at the website that we've developed with Sophia Gelati and others of our research team and Noah Snyder for some new NSF funding we have to look at anthrop anthropogenic sediment and an anthropocene streams throughout New England and the Mid-Atlantic region and then a paper we published on this a few years ago. All right, so why does it matter? Um, it turns out that when people see these deeply incised streams and high banks and collapsing banks, they attribute the problem almost always to whatever they can see happening today in the landscape. 
And that might be cows, it might be urbanization, it might be the building of Walmarts and par parking lots. And the attempts to restore them are often associated with putting boulders along the banks. Um, that was more commonly done a few years ago than now, fortunately. And it can cost quite a bit of money, and it doesn't seem to be very successful at slowing the rate of bank erosion and reducing the amount of fine sediment going into waterways that ultimately might go to the various bays and, and be impaired water bodies, such as the Chesapeake Bay. And when we first began working on the origin of the sediments that we saw in the stream banks, you can see me back here in the background and Mike Ronis in the foreground, we were wondering about these various types of deposits. This is probably a reworked loss right here. And we went down to look at some of the sites where Red's woman um, of Johns Hopkins and Luna Leopold from the USGS and then Berkeley had worked throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And we began to realize that every one of their sites that we went to, we could find evidence of a mill. And in fact, at this site, the restoration was called Witten's Mill Park after it was done. And we began to realize that all of these places where we could see this record of historic sediment burying a Holocene wetland and then a deeper Pleistocene rubble layer were associated with some kind of recent human activity that caused um, ponding of water or slowing of water and rapid sedimentation. And of course, there was plenty of sediment coming off the hillsides during early land clearing and farming and charcoaling, et cetera. So it requires us to think a little differently about landscapes. Things that happen to be stream banks today haven't always been. And in fact, in this particular case, nothing here is really truly fluvial in origin. It's, in fact, the base of it was a hillside, essentially, and then a wetland. So we've been recommending that people might want, including ourselves, might want to reconsider how we view things. And I use an example now that's called anamorphosis, which um, we can best um, illustrate with a painting from Hans Holbein the Younger. And we can see here is there's some object we don't recognize. And if we, if we were to go to the right and look 90 degrees along it and get next to it and look right along the painting, we see it's a, a skull. So we have to shift our view. We have to view things from a different perspective. And instead of saying, look at that screen channel and look at the bank erosion, which might be from excess stormwater runoff, et cetera, rather, could it be from a history of land use change and a, and a periglacial history of rubble formation, et cetera, that, that is ultimately controlling, these trajectories are controlling what's happening in the landscape, not just the, the most recent few decades or centuries of human impact. And there are many classic papers which are uh, quite phenomenal in terms of the detail, the observations, um, the writing is beautifully, it's beautifully written. And they talk about the origin of these um, valley bottoms as being natural, so that this particular surface here was described as a natural river floodplain. And Luna and Reds had recognized that they're very common and very typical. But, and they tried to explain it as this meandering stream you can see here, which is Seneca Creek migrating back and forth and depositing rubble on one side as a gravel bar depositing fine sediment above as an overbank floodplain system. And many streams out west are, are like that, in fact. But it doesn't explain in the long term the streams in this region. It explains the modern incised Anthropocene stream, but not ultimately all the rubble down there or even the bulk of the historic sediment. Right. And so here's an example then of the mill that we actually found evidence of that existed downstream from where Reds and Luna had done quite a bit of their work along Watts Creek, Watts Branch. So the mill dam was here and the mill building was here, and this is a painting at the Smithsonian that we were able to go look at and photograph. And it was um, painted by William Henry Holmes, who was one of the early associate directors of the Smithsonian. So the early work where Reds and Luna had done cross-section was, was actually along one of these incised streams where there had been races and so forth. What happens when a dam is built in a valley bottom, um, there are many examples. There were some 16,000 dams in Pennsylvania in the 1700s and 1800s state has pretty good records on many thousands of those. And when a dam is built, you can see one under construction here, a base level is, the base level is raised. There's a higher level to the water surface, which you can also see over here with an older mill. And that raised water level and that ponded water then are used to help turn a wheel in the case of the early mills and later turbines. So these are quite charming and they were ubiquitous and we associate them um, with a kind of bucolic landscape, but they're actually industrial. It's an industrial landscape, and they were associated with a lot of activity and economic um, turnover. What happens then geomorphically is a dam is built, perhaps where there was a wet meadow, as in the case of mid-Atlantic Piedmont Valley bottoms and some region valley bottoms. A dam is built, there's the ponded water level, the incoming sediment is trapped behind that, maybe not all, but some, and it rises up to that level. 
we can actually test that using airborne LIDAR. So here's a profile we've made using LIDAR for one example. There are many. And we can see that terrace surface, which is the historic sediment, and note that it's not just a horizontal level graded to the, the dam, but there's a sediment wedge built up that um, is a new transport slope. Mike Granis has put together some very nice stuff about this. Since this PowerPoint will be online, you'll be able to you have a copy of it. You can go and check out this website. He also has um, uh, on our website, he's even showing how you can locate some of the mill um, dams that used to be in the region. We published on this work in 2008 on the cover of Science. Here is a LIDAR-derived image showing the various steps in the valley bottom associated with the dropping below different dams. So there are multiple dams. Often today, they're the sites of um, bridges and road crossings and so forth. And the modern streams are cut into that historic sediment, which buries Toe Slope. We were shocked to find how many of these dams existed. And they're not usually in the National Inventory of Dams database that the Army Corps of Engineers had because they're too old, too small usually, but there are many of them. The state of Pennsylvania is one of the leaders in the nation of low head dam removal. Many are unsafe, they're obsolete, they're expensive to maintain, and this is just the ones we know about. So these are actual locations in the historic maps, and it was Bob who first began going to the historic maps at historical societies and digging these out and plotting them up in GIS, and then later Mike Ronis worked with us and many students. We were just astonished to see that the milling had affected so much of the waterways. When we went and checked the laws, the early laws, we read about the mill acts, and then the mill crowding acts, we saw that it was actually to be expected because these were ways to make money. And, it was, and there was no other major source of power at that time. So of course, people would put in as many mills as they could. So again, this is just the ones we know about here in Pennsylvania in these three counties on the Conestoga and the Brandywine and other rivers. We also used 1840 census data and found that there have been 65,000 water-powered mills as of that point in time with a very large concentration right here in the Mid-Atlantic region with the dot size proportional to the number of mills in a given county at that time. And you can see then compared to the glacial limits where we're located here in the Mid-Atlantic region and the Chesapeake Bay, and it matters because we have a lot of stored historic sediment which is now washing out of the waterways as these dams breach. And, and also, as the dams breach, streams are generally incising down to that Pleistocene rubble and exposing these Holocene wetlands. And that's giving us outcrops that might not even have even existed 50 years ago. As Thomas Jefferson said, no neighborhood has no, there's no neighborhood without a mill. That's the ice margin. All right, so you can, I'll show you what happens when a dam breaches, if it's filled with sediment, as these older ones are. And this is based on the work of Alessandro Cantelli at University of Minnesota. Get back and get that again. So a dam breaches, as in this bloom experiment, and there's incision, a nick point propagates up the valley. There's bank erosion down here now and no bank erosion up there. But once that drop in base level makes it up through that reservoir, that former reservoir, we'll then see that there's channel widening going on all along it. You can see the bank collapse of this non, relatively non-cohesive, weak material. And that's what we have here. Although in our case, there's some cohesion to it, you can see the buried black soil. That's the Holocene wetland. With this big spring where we're now doing that long-term restoration monitoring. And so the bank retreat here, the bank, lateral bank erosion, is, is not the result of any change in land use. The land use here has actually been the same for centuries. It's a result of the fact that downstream the mill dam had breached. A number of other smaller dams that had been built in the valley had also become obsolete and failed and were no longer maintained. So this allows us to see that black buried soil, like the one at Great Marsh, but the one at Great Marsh is not buried. And the modern streams can now pick up some of that whole Pleistocene gravel and sand and so forth and use it to build some small inset bars. There are many efforts to try to plant trees along these unstable banks um, in the efforts to make riparian corridors. And there were 3,500 planted here at the Big Spring Run site, but by the, by the mid-2000s, most were gone. There were less than a dozen left. So we were approached about what to do about this site. We recommended a new approach based on our, our interpretation that's a very young stream, actually, where there used to be a very old wetland, in fact. So we proposed this to the state and to EPA, and we said that in the Pleistocene, that valley bottom would have looked much like this, frozen with some thaw lakes. And then in the Holocene, it would have looked much like the right, a Holocene wet meadow, and that's based on our thousands of seeds that Ali Neubauer um, extracted and identified with Bill Hogartner and Jeff Hartrans. And so it went from Pleistocene, Periglacial tundra, to post-thaw Holocene wetland, 
And then it was buried with colonial mill pond sediment, and then that was incised as the dam breached, and then trees were planted on top of that um, stack of reservoir sediment. And then, um, and it's quite dry actually up on this stack of sediment. So we proposed just remove that sediment. Rather than try to stabilize the banks with boulders, let's just remove 20,000 tons of historic sediment. So we did that. And on the right you see, this is the wetland today. That is the post-restoration wetland. And that's the same view. These trees are those trees. So that's it during restoration, um, prior to the establishment of all the vegetation. And we tried to establish a vegetation suite that's very similar to what we have today. It looks a bit aggressive to go out there with um, this equipment, even though it's on, a very, it's on treads that have very low pressure per square inch. The guy in the cab actually was using RTK GPS and was digging down to the level of the black soil based on our survey data. This is um, Land Studies did the restoration, working with um, us and many others. So they simply removed that 20,000 tons of sediment. And prior to that, we had done eight years of monitoring with the U.S. Geological Survey and other agencies. And we're still continuing that mo monitoring. We selected this site because there had been monitoring there in the past. But here's an example, standing along the stream channel before um, restoration and the exact same view after restoration. So all that's been done really is remove sediment, lower the banks. And then we often are asked where did that sediment go? It ended up by happenstance after a few years outside our back door practically near Franklin and Marshall campus. It's a brownfield redevelopment site and they needed topsoil, good top. All right, folks, we seem to have lost audio with Dorothy. We're going to get it back. Just give us a couple minutes. Nick, can you hear me? I'm being told that there's no audio right now. Yeah, Dorothy, we can hear you. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Should I back up, do you think? Yeah, about two slides, I think. Slides. All right. Thank you. Thanks to my crew for running in to tell me. <laughs> All right. So let's get back here. All right, back there, you guys? Yeah, that looks right. All right, so before and after restoration, all the sediment on the left is now gone. Those banks are no longer there to erode. And we actually, by the way, I should mention, we kept track of those erosion rates. 
And there's a sediment now, it's deposited nearby in a brown, so it's been spread out since then and revegetated. So we're doing all of these things to try to understand whether or not we can actually make a shallow vegetated flow system that will be sustainable and stable much the way the Holocene wetland was. And we're trying to enhance hydrologic exchange, hyperbaric exchange between surface and groundwater, improve water quality by reducing sediment loads, by um, increasing hyperbaric exchange, we're getting denitrification and we're monitoring that, we're more monitoring carbon retention, et cetera. So please check the website to get many more details. There's a lengthy report there and many publications that are in the works that will be coming out and a lot of updates of data. So with the USGS, we had a gauge station up here at the, at coming into the restoration site, which begins right there, and then it's restored all the way down to that fence line. We have another gauge station over here monitoring what's coming in at this end and then a third at the downstream end monitoring what's leaving the restoration reach. So we're keeping track of what's coming in and what's going out and how that's changed with time from eight years prior, during the eight years prior to restoration and then ever since, and it was restored in 2011. We fly over it repeatedly. We also use a drone. We have um, web cameras that we have used. Jim Moore and Bob Johnson, Robert Johnson had set up a web camera here and another one up here. You can see the end of the restoration reach right there. This is not restored. And then down here, this is not restored. So in the, the restoration reach, there are multiple little channels. Some of them are hard to see, but there are many little multi-branching channels, and it has become a wet meadow system. Um, we're fortunate to work with UNASCO, with Marianne O'Call and Keith, um, um, Brendan Hodge and Keith Williams and others, and with Dora Zhu here at FNM, who's been doing thesis work on this and post back work, using ground-based LIDAR, repeat scanning of ground-based LIDAR, to actually try to look at vegetation over time. And we're also doing a lot of repeat RTK GPS surveying. Um, so, but with the ground-based LIDAR, what's fascinating is we're able, Dora is actually working on trying to quantify the vegetation and then working with Laurel Larson and Danielle Watts and others at Berkeley, we clip the vegetation, we weigh it, and we compare those estimates of the, the volume and, and mass of vegetation. And then we're also monitoring with the USGS and part of Dora's thesis work, the amount of carbon accumulating in the soil because there is some very fine sediment accumulating in this part of the restoration reach with time. So it's a really neat way of using ground-based LIDAR to assess what's going on. And then we've done some flow modeling with Art Perola at University of Louisville and Ward Oberholtz for Land Studies. And what we're doing, I won't show the before um, restoration flow modeling, but by taking a given flood event, we can look then at what happens during a flood. So we take a given gauge record for a given flood from our USGS gauge stations. You can see it's out here during a flood and the water spreading out over bank. And then we can model that to see how the shear stresses change along the valley. And the blues are showing us very low shear stresses because the water is shallow and spreads out wide. Whereas prior to this, if you go check our website, you'll see the previous um, restoration modeling. We had a deep, narrow channel. It was carrying fist-sized gravel. So a place, we're at the headwaters. You can see the drainage divide in the background. A place that was a headwaters limestone spring, many springs, was carrying fist-sized gravel because of deep incision into historic sediment. So it's remarkable. So I'd like to end just by saying that we are really enjoying working on all these projects. And it's the, I was, I'm very happy to see that there are so many people who are involved in this work and contributing in so many ways, looking at this plant and animal species, the, the bog turtles, the David Bounds work, and so forth. It's been very rewarding, and we look forward to your questions and future communication. You can email us. Um, you can check our website, et cetera. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Dorothy. Um, right now we're going to open it up to questions. Again, I'll, I'll tell you down in the lower right-hand side of your screen there in the Q&A, you can put questions in there, and then I'll uh, read them aloud as appropriate. Um, just to get us started, I have a, uh, my own question. Um, you touched on it a little bit in your presentation, Dorothy, but you talked about all the sediment you removed in your latest project, and you're using it now on F&M. Can you just explain a little bit more about what that is and what you're doing with it? Yes, yeah, and as I did mention at the beginning that Bob Walter is here, so I'll be looking towards him in case he has any more comments to add to this. But we had done a lot of testing. Bob's a geochemist, and we had done multiple tests on the sediment over many years. It's largely silt. And we actually think it's largely windblown silt that is a legacy of um, glacial activity and post-glacial activity. And then that silt, which had been worked into the soils on the hillsides, had moved down the slopes during European land clearing and farming and, and grazing and so forth, and ended up in the valley bottom. So it was fairly uniform in size and fairly organic rich, in fact. 
And so it would be, it's a shame to not do something good with it. And we've long thought that it could be put to a very high purpose, hopefully. And there, one could put it back on the hillside, and that's happened to some restoration sites. There are others now, like this particular restoration project, just not as advanced in terms of the, the monitoring and, and the many collaborators, but there are others. Because it was high quality sediment, high quality fine grained soil, it was valuable and it could be used for these sorts of brownfield redevelopment sites. But there is the cost of trucking, and that is a limiting factor. During times of um, low gas prices, that's much easier to do than during times of, of high gas prices. But in this case, for this one brownfield redevelopment, they were looking for soil, and our soil happened to be relatively close by. So it was bought along with some other topsoil and then hauled here. Great, thanks. Um, a question from the audience. What nutrients have you found in your monitoring, and is there a temporary water or sediment quality effect during restoration? Yes, um, there are relatively high nitrate levels in the groundwater at the Big Springs site. And in the surface water, they were also picking up, in addition to the nitrates, um, relatively high levels of phosphorus. And Bob had determined that there was quite a bit of phosphorus in this historic sediment um, absorbed onto the um, silt particles and clay particles. And that during bank erosion, it was actually um, then transported along the surface water during flow events. So there, there were both, um, there was phosphorus there carried along with the particulate matter, and then nitrates um, in solution. And the phosphorus is one thing that we think we've been able to reduce quite a bit because it's no longer, the, the amount that was in the stream banks is no longer there. And Bob has done some fingerprinting work with Alan Gellis and others, some chemical fingerprinting. They've been able to show that in fact there is now um, much less of a signal of phosphorus in the, the sediment load than there was prior to restoration. The nitrates work will take much longer time to resolve, we think, because we have groundwater wells with EPA and USGS, some 30, I think, and we have nested piezometers. And they're, they're still working on all that water quality data to try to determine if there's been a, a change post-restoration. And one of, one of our hopes is that with the increasing carbon retention going on, and we know that's happening, that there is carbon retention, um, we hope that that will lead to greater denitrification in that wetland valley bottom. Places like Great Marsh have some of the highest water quality in the state of Pennsylvania, um, an example of how these wetlands can really do great things for um, reducing nutrients, re reducing nutrient loads be below the abnormally high levels in many places today. Okay, um, the next question I have um, from Paul Stacey, he's asked, I wonder if beaver damming on the first order First and second order streams during pre-colonial times might have built up big reservoirs of headwater sediments, and then that was released as beavers were hunted down in, in that area. What might, is this coincidental with the mill dam construction and rapid filling of those sediments? Do you have any insights into that? Yes, we do. Um, and I'd love to talk more with that person later too. We really like, we like the beaver questions and we get them often during talks. Well, um, Bill Hogartner also is doing some research on this the ecologist, he's at Johns Hopkins. Um, we have never found evidence of beaver, except for maybe one case, in any of the valley bottoms we've worked in. And I mean, when I say evidence, I mean in the, the black soils, the buried Holocene black soils. We don't find um, the beaver dams. We don't find chewed logs. In one site, we might have. And we always wondered about that. We, we, we were certain that even if they had been there, which we think they might have been, that there wouldn't have been large amounts of sediment trapped because we, we need the land clearing to get the silt released from the hillside. It was very stable in the tree-covered and grassland-covered hillside, so that the silt was stable in the Holocene. There's no record of, of sedimentation in the Holocene in any of these valley bottoms prior to European arrival. So the, there was no silt to accumulate behind a beaver dam. We wonder whether there might have been beaver here, and one of the ideas that Bill has come up with based on some extensive literature review now is that where there is evidence of beaver, it's usually in headwaters where it's more mountainous, headwater streams, for example, in western Maryland, rather than out in the, pe the lowland Piedmonts of Lancaster County, you know, parts of Maryland and, and York County. So maybe the beaver didn't like those wet meadows very much for some reason. They're wide. Um, they're very, maybe they preferred to go off into the side ravines. So we might, we might find them over there in the steeper side tributaries. No There's no archaeological evidence of them yet that we know of. Thanks, Dorothy. 
The next question is, what time of year did you see the thermal contraction polygons on the, your Google Earth imagery? Yes, we have, well, we look usually, and this is what Gao did in September, August, September, when it's getting drier and crops have been harvested. If there are still crops standing, we can't see them. Um, and we have found that in a, a given area, we can see them on one field and not on another, even at that same time of year. And yet we know they're there in both cases, and maybe in another year we can see them in the other field. And it has to do them with the timing of cropping, we think. So that's important, and, it's, and the things that are growing, it seems, matter. Uh, it, one of my students has been saying, in fact, that she thinks we need to focus on a certain type of, of field where they might have had, I think she said, corn. Maybe that drives the soil more than soybean, I'm not sure. But certainly it's September, October, but not every September, August, September, excuse me. Some years we don't, maybe the soil's wetter. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, could you speak to the applicability of the methods and approaches that used in Pennsylvania, Maryland for, red, for river restoration to other areas in the U.S. that might not have, that might have other types of anthropogenic influences, not necessarily just dams? Yes, what I would say is that um, it, from what we've learned, it's so important to understand the, the entire trajectory of landscape development and how it's related to the hydrology. In our case, that it was a combination of a lot of sediment from frost shattering moving down the slopes into the valley bottoms and then with thaw having high groundwater tables because it's a you know, mid-latitude temperate, humid temperate region, so groundwater is high. And in fact, I didn't go into the details, but we see different types of wetlands based on their position with respect to the long-term groundwater table. So in another region, if there, weren't, if there hadn't been a high groundwater table in a wet meadow, that would matter in terms of restoration. If there were steeper slopes and greater sediment supplies, you know, coming off the Rockies, for example, that would matter. New England, North Carolina, though, seem to be have many similarities to this region, albeit in New England it was glaciated. But going down to North Carolina, where it's certainly much warmer and it probably didn't have much permafrost, if any, except at higher altitudes, up in the higher mountainous areas. Um, we still see this Carl Wegman's work, for example, shows that, and other people, now Dan Richter's working there at Duke and with his colleagues, that there is plenty of historic sediment and that if the incision and bank erosion is largely the result of a recent dam breach and if the storage of that sediment is largely the result of a, a dam that was built sometime in the past, then that would really matter to the restoration approaches. So we, we often say it's important to diagnose the problem correctly, to not immediately assume that it's you know, just stormwater runoff, but really to look carefully at the history of that landscape and to try to understand how did the sediment get there in the first place and when and what was this landscape for the last so many thousands of years? And it would be different in each part of the country. You know, as we go south, in fact, we know we're going into the zone of discontinuous permafrost. We can tell that geologically and stratigraphically. And as we come out of that, we get into much more chemically weathered rocks, for example. So there is a difference, although we still see um, ubiquity of wetland valley bottoms. Okay, great. Um, Next question is, you mentioned that this wetland restoration can be more successful than using boulders to protect the bank erosion. What about compared to regrading the banks or planting a riparian buffer? Do you think this would be unsuccessful in this area? I wouldn't say unsuccessful, and it would depend on the bank heights. When we're close to a dam, downstream close to a dam, and, and dams vary in height, of course, so some, the mean dam height for Lancaster County was about, I think it was 12 feet. Um, but in other places, we've seen dams as high, old dams as high as 30 feet. So in those places, it's, it's a lot of grading. There's a dam along um, Gunpowder Falls, for example, that's 30 feet high, um, the Hoffman Dam. That would be a lot of grading in that case. But in lower, in lower dam heights, or way up the reservoir, way up the valley where it's only a few feet of historic sediment, that could work, and it might be a cheaper alternative just to remove some of the sediment. And at one of the restoration sites we've been to with land studies, they couldn't remove all of the historic sediment due to the cost, but they removed some. It was more than just grading the banks back. They actually removed, tried to remove down to a wetland level for um, a swath down the valley. And it's been very successful at maintaining a wetland environment down there. But I think in some cases where there's not a lot of historic sediment that grading back some distance and planting riparian um, species could be helpful, certainly. So it's a triage. Sure. 
triage approach would be would be best, I think. Find a site. We've often said if you can if you find a site where you have lots of bank erosion and there's a possibility of doing what we did here, for example, and making it a park and so forth, one could reduce a lot of sediment loads in that case. Other places it might be people living there, buildings, et cetera, that can't be done. Thanks. It looks like that's all the time we have for questions today. Um, as you, I wanted to thank you, Dorothy, and for our participants. As you sign off the webinar, you'll be re redirected to our website. This is where you'll find the information on today's webinar, and we'll be posting the presentations and recording in about a week or so. With that, I'd like to thank our speaker again, Dr. Dorothy Merritts, and thank you all again for participating. This concludes the webinar, and have a great day. Thank you, everybody, and I'll just end with Great Morsh one more time to have a happy landscape. Good day. <laughs>